and um, and uh, un until the end. But I'll be monitoring the chat box uh, on the on on Google Meet here. And if you'd like to get in queue for a question, just go ahead and post uh, in into the chat box. And then when we get done, uh, when Zach and Evan are done with their presentation. Um, I'll just start running down the queue and inviting people to open their microphones and ask their questions. Uh, so while Evan and Zach start, if you folks don't mind muting yourselves, uh, then, uh, as I say, then we'll just turn it right over. Uh, Evan, Zach, welcome to Novak. Great. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. And let me start sharing my screen mm -hmm. right now. And okay, can you guys see that? Yes. Yes. All right, excellent. Okay. All right. Well, hello everybody. Welcome. My name is Evan Kramer, and I am so happy you're joining me today for my presentation titled The Mars 2020 Perseverance Rover a mission overview and an insider's perspective on what it is like to work with an extraordinary team on an incredibly complex project. I'm a member of the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory or JPL, Solar System Ambassador Program, which is an organization of over 1,000 volunteers across the United States who host public outreach events on various NASA related topics. I just finished up my undergraduate degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Maryland College Park and I was a NOVAC member throughout my time at Lake Braddock Secondary School from 2012 to 2016. Last summer, I was an engineering intern at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And I worked on a mission you may be familiar with since a seventh grader from our area, Alex Mather, named it. Yes, I worked on NASA's next Mars rover called Perseverance. Specifically, I worked on two of its seven main science instruments, MassCam-Z and Sherlock. As you'll see later in the presentation, MassCam-Z is a stereo camera system that uses two cameras placed near the top of Perseverance's mast to take 3D panorama images of Mars, while Sherlock is a type of spectrometer that uses a laser to excite particles on the surface of Mars and study whether or not there are any organic compounds present. I'd also like to introduce Mr. Zach Bailey, who was my internship mentor last summer. Zach has been a part of the Perseverance Rover's payload team since December 2013, and he oversaw the development, delivery, integration, and testing of the MassCam-Z and Sherlock instruments. Over my 11-week internship last summer, I learned some amazing things about how to design, build, test, launch, and operate a Mars rover, as well as the out-of-this-world team of scientists and engineers it takes to pull it all off. Tonight, I'll share some of the things I learned with you. And after I finish my presentation, you will all have an opportunity to ask me and Zach questions about anything Mars Rover related. So let's begin. I'd like to start out by sharing these two pictures with you. Both pictures are very real. However, one happens to have been taken by NASA's Curiosity Rover on Mars and the other happens to be a photo of Death Valley National Park in Southern California. I'll pause now to let you take a guess as to which photo was taken on Earth and which was taken on Mars. Regardless of whether or not you match the photos to their locations correctly, I like to look at photo comparisons like this to A, remind myself how similar other planets in our solar system look compared to our own, and B, fuel the curiosity which motivates me and most other NASA scientists and engineers to go explore other planets and find out whether they have ever supported life. To get you up to speed on NASA's exploration of Mars, we can look at the heritage of the Perseverance rover. The goals for NASA's Mars Exploration Program, which started in 1994, are to explore Mars and to provide scientific information and discovery through a series of robotic orbiters, stationary landers, and mobile laboratories. This slide shows just some of the more recent orbiters, landers, and rovers that are a part of this exploration program. However, in total, two landers, 
five rovers, and six orbiters have successfully operated on the surface or in orbit around Mars. Although each one of these missions took an incredible feat of engineering to accomplish, they're all driven by five science questions we want to answer. These questions include, how did Mars form and what was its early planetary evolution like? How have geological and climate processes changed Mars over time? Could Mars have hosted life in the past? Could humans ever explore Mars and eventually live there? And how similar is Mars to Earth? Each mission contributes new knowledge and helps better design future missions to thoroughly answer the questions we have posed. Now that you're up to speed, we can introduce Perseverance. This slide shows an artist's rendition of what the Perseverance rover would look like on Mars with its seven science instruments and robotic arm labeled. The main body or chassis of Perseverance is identical to the Curiosity rovers, which was launched in 2011. Perseverance has six wheels and uses what's called a rocker bogey system as its suspension design for driving over rough terrain on Mars. Perseverance has a robotic arm with a drill and science instruments on the end for studying the Martian surface. It also has its own neck and head or mast, which enables it to see its surroundings. For power, Perseverance's back trunk has what is called a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, or RTG, which converts differences in temperature to electricity. Like I said on the previous slide, although each Mars mission takes an incredible feat of engineering to accomplish, they're all science-driven. On this slide, we can see just how science-driven Perseverance is. Perseverance has seven primary science instruments. Some of these instruments are powerfully upgraded versions of the Curiosity rover's instruments, such as MassCam-Z, which is a stereo camera system that can create 3D panorama images of Mars. The Z in MassCam-Z comes from the new zoom feature the two cameras have, which was lacking in the Curiosity rover's MassCam instrument. On the other hand, some instruments are completely new, like MOXIE, or the Mars Oxygen in Situ experiment. MOXIE is helping NASA prepare to send humans to Mars by showing how the atmosphere of Mars, which is mostly made out of carbon dioxide, can be converted to oxygen by electrochemical processes at 800 degrees Celsius. The converted oxygen could be used as rocket propellant and be used as breathable air for humans. Now, as if these awesome instrument upgrades weren't exciting enough, Perseverance will be carrying along a small helicopter called Ingenuity. This small helicopter will attempt to demonstrate the ability to fly drone-like vehicles on Mars, with the possibility of sending swarms of exploration drones to Mars in the future. I've been told that the Mars helicopter and Perseverance rover will take the ultimate selfie by taking photos of each other with their cameras while the Mars helicopter is in the air. Although we already went over the general questions we are attempting to answer about Mars, the Perseverance rover has four of its own specific mission objectives. The first objective is to understand the geology of Mars and specifically how it relates to hosting life. So we will specifically look for evidence of the ingredients of life, such as water and essential energy sources in the ancient rocks on Mars, which will lead to an understanding of whether living on Mars in the past was ever a possibility. The second objective is to understand the astrobiology of Mars. This is our direct search for biosignatures or the patterns, textures, and chemical compounds we believe would only be present if life existed on Mars. The third objective is to collect samples of the Martian surface from locations we think have the best chance of showing signs of past life. After the samples are collected by the drill on the end of Perseverance's arm, they will be cached or stored in sample tubes and left on the surface. A future mission called Mars Sample Return could then pick up those samples from the surface of Mars and bring them back to Earth for scientists to study. The fourth and final objective is to prepare for humans to one day explore Mars by demonstrating technologies essential for keeping astronauts safe on the surface. This is Perseverance's mission timeline. 
The landing site where Perseverance will touch down on Mars was selected in 2018. Perseverance started being designed in 2014, started being built in 2016, and started being tested in 2018. The launch window is scheduled to open on July 22nd this year. Perseverance will then cruise in space for around half a year. Then, in February of next year, it will land on the surface of Mars, after which it will begin its primary mission. I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these phases to give you insight into how a Mars rover takes shape over time. Many different landing sites were proposed for the Perseverance rover, and it took five years to narrow down all the options to just one. The top left image in this slide shows the Perseverance rover's landing site scientists picked on Mars called Jezero Crater. Jezero Crater is outlined in black, and the different colors represent the elevation of the surface, with blue and purple representing lower elevations, and green, yellow, and red representing higher elevations. Jezero Crater is 30 miles across, and is thought to have once been filled with water. In fact, the word Jezero means lake in several Slavic languages. Along the edge of Jezero Crater's rim, outlined in black, we can see signs of ancient inlet and outlet valleys, which are clues as to how water flowed into and out of the ancient lake. The white ellipse shows the area in which Perseverance will land inside Jezero Crater. Shifting our attention over to the top right image, which was taken by one of NASA's orbiters around Mars, we see a zoomed in version of the red box shown on the top left picture. In this zoomed in image, we see an ancient river delta, much like what you would see if you looked at the famous Nile River Delta in Egypt from space. We see rich deposits of clays, silicate minerals, and other interesting compounds which are shown in yellow, blue, and red. These chemical compounds are indicative of a possible previously habitable environment. The picture at the bottom right of the slide is a map of the entire surface of Mars. The location of Jezero Crater is shown in red. Once you've selected a landing site, you've got to make something to send there. All of the Mars rovers you have heard of, like Spirit, Opportunity, Curiosity, and now Perseverance, have been built here at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. NASA has over 10 research centers across the United States, and although JPL counts as one of them, it is the only center that is actually run by a university, the California Institute of Technology. This makes JPL unique because it has a variety of resources available to it. It attracts some of the brightest minds in the world, and it has its own separate funding pipeline. Designing, building, and testing a spacecraft is the phase of a mission I enjoy the most, because that's not only the phase you get to decide how the spacecraft will work, but you also get to test your ideas to make sure they will work. In terms of design, each one of the thousands of parts that make up the Perseverance rover have to be precisely modeled to make sure they will accomplish their desired function and not interfere with any other parts on the rover. Engineering drawings must be made using computer-aided design software programs for every rover part, similar to what you see in the top right picture which shows the final models of the Sherlock instrument and MassCamZ's camera head and calibration targets. Additionally, system assemblies, like the one you see in the top left image of the rover's arm and sample caching mechanism, are created using each of the individually modeled parts to serve as a blueprint for building. After your design is validated by years of modeling and simulation, you can start building the individual parts and integrating them together. Some parts get made at JPL, while many get made by other companies that JPL hires. The Perseverance rover started to really take physical shape last summer. For example, I took the bottom left picture last summer from the clean room viewing gallery, and it shows engineers getting ready to lift the turret assembly, which features Perseverance's Sherlock and Pixel instruments, as well as its drill, for installation on the end of its arm. These engineers are called ATLO engineers, or Assembly, Test, and Launch Operation Engineers, 
And they are the people who get to physically build and install the components that go to space and other planetary bodies. They are working in a huge clean room and are all wearing bunny suits, which help to prevent them from contaminating any of the hardware they work with. This is done to follow the rules of planetary protection, which are strict guidelines NASA created to make sure our spacecraft don't accidentally bring any forms of life from Earth to other planetary bodies. I also took the bottom right picture last summer, and it shows an Atlo engineer taking a photo with his iPhone from the right mass cam Z camera head for documentation purposes. So once your parts are designed, built, and assembled to specification, you need to thoroughly test each and every component to make sure it works. Now, it should be mentioned that every part that gets integrated to the rover has already been tested through and through, but retesting your components after integration to the rover is essential for making sure your part is still functioning properly when part of the entire system. I was fortunate enough to join the Perseverance payload team during the intense testing timeframe last summer, and I was able to contribute to each subphase of testing for the MassCamZ and Sherlock instruments. On this slide, I give an overview of what it takes to run a test procedure in ATLO on the flight rover, and spoiler alert, it takes a lot. <laughs> First, you have to design and write your procedure. You start by outlining the functions of your instrument you want to test. And this outline has to be carefully crafted because time in ATLO is the most valuable commodity around at JPL. So while you may have hundreds of operational requirements you need to meet to validate your instrument's performance, you most certainly don't have time to directly test each one. Instead, you have to strategically devise ways to extract all of the information you need to verify your requirements by performing a carefully planned set of calibrations and measurements. Once you've explicitly defined a step-by-step -step procedure, you run it through a simulation program called WISTIS, or Workstation Test Set. WISTIS is meant to simulate the rover's flight software and you'll be able to see if any of the commands and argument parameters you set throw any errors in the rover flight software. Once you make a flawless simulation run in WISTIS, you can get to run your procedure in the test bed where you have physical hardware to work with. While the hardware you're working with may not have all the functionality that the real flight hardware has, you can verify that the data products you receive after sending commands are accurate. An example of this would be to send a take image command using auto exposure to the MassCamZ testbed model, then open up the data product to see that a well exposed image was taken. After you run a perfect run in the, in the testbed, you get to run it in ATLO. Notice how the blue arrows are pointing in both directions on this slide. That was done purposefully since there's an incredible amount of iteration in the process that takes nonstop work for months. Now, that was a very top level overview of how to get to ALO. And you may have questions about some of the specifics of each of these steps because there are a lot of them. So let's break it down a little bit. A lot of my work last summer was to help get the Sherlock functional procedure designed, simulated, tested, and ultimately run in ATLO. A functional test procedure is essentially meant to test every mission critical operational feature of an instrument to ensure it can perform the job it was meant to do on Mars. I've, highlight, I've highlighted just a few of Sherlock's major features we wanted to test on this slide. Sherlock is actually more like two instruments than one. Sherlock Auto Context Imager, or ACI, is the native fluorescence and Raman spectroscopy part of the instrument, while the aptly named Watson is a camera that is meant to take engineering and path planning images, just like the Molly instrument on the Curiosity rover. Sherlock ACI first uses its deep ultraviolet laser to perform native fluorescence scans of surface objects in its field of view. Fluorescence in this wavelength range has only been observed to be signatures of organics trapped inside the mineral matrix of the field sample. A follow-on measurement of the same field of view 
using the phenomenon of Raman scattering to measure the shift of wavelength of the laser beam when it scatters off of a bond containing organic molecules is used to further characterize the types of organic bonds in a fluorescent region. A co-boresided visible light imager is used to take context images of the laser scanned region. Watson is a sort of general purpose camera, but I suspect it will be known as the selfie camera used to produce selfie images similar to those Curiosity produces. Both Sherlock ACI and Watson have a variety of operational features we needed to validate from ensuring the co-boresided visible context imager and laser optical paths are properly aligned to ensuring that Z stacking images taken at multiple focus positions could be merged into one for a large depth of field. Couple the various functions we wanted to test with the external test hardware we needed to install and manipulate, and you have a very tall task of strategically organizing your test procedure for maximum data production efficiency. Once we put together our first version of the Sherlock functional test procedure, I sent each of the over 600 commands in order to WISTIS, our tool meant to simulate the rover flight software. During operation, the way commands are sent to the rover is broken down into S commands and I commands. S commands, or spacecraft commands, are sent from Earth via JPL's deep space network antennas to orbiters around Mars, which then downlink to Perseverance. S commands are translated by the rover compute element, or RCE, to I commands, or instrument commands, which are sent to each appropriate instrument. WISTIS is meant to simulate the RCE and allows us to validate that the S commands we send from Earth don't throw any errors, are translated into the proper instrument commands, and produce the expected data products like images. A lot of iteration happens here between WISTIS and rewriting the test procedure until you can achieve a perfect WISTIS run. In the testbed, we have engineering models and testbed models of our instruments. While WISTIS is only a simulation mostly used to verify that the parameters you're setting and your commands are valid, the testbed is where you can actually analyze data products created by the hardware you're controlling. You also get to practice installing and maneuvering any external test support equipment you'll need in ATLO, like how I'm changing a calibration target from Sherlock's target snout in the left image. Test bed shifts are also a very valuable commodity. There are physical rover compute elements in the test bed, and all seven instruments need to use the RCEs to run their tests. So, Time in the testbed is divided into long eight hour shifts and they run on the weekends and into late hours at night. I never thought I would enjoy going to work on a Sunday, but I suppose running the Sherlock functional test procedure for eight hours on a Sunday to qualify it for ATLO is an exception. One of the cool data products we got to analyze was the image that got produced when we sent a Z stacking image command to Watson. The top right image shows the raw merged image from the Watson testbed unit. If you look closely, you'll notice that everything in the frame, regardless of its location in the field of view, is in focus, showing that the Z stacking and merging command worked. The bottom right image shows a depth map of the merged image's field of view that also gets returned as a data product. Using the focus ring's position, and sharp edge analysis to identify which objects are in focus, we can generate a picture of object depth where darker colors represent objects closer to Watson and lighter colors represent objects further from Watson. After considerable iteration in the testbed, WISTIS, and procedure revision, we finally graduate to ATLO. To test your instruments in ATLO, you send the commands in your test procedure to the flight instruments from the System Test Center, or STC. In STC, you have the instrument team who put together the test procedure and ATLO personnel who actually load the commands to the command queue 
and send them to the RCE. Running your procedure in Atlo is intense since you really only get one shot to get everything right. A significant failure could be disastrous since the Atlo schedule is packed 24 7. So, when a problem arises, which they seemingly always do, you have to be able to immediately address the problem as you'll hear on a later slide. Regardless of the high stress envir environment, some of my favorite experiences last summer were in the STC for both the MassCam Z and Sherlock functional test procedures. The top left picture is a photo of me, two engineers from Mainland Space Sciences, the MassCam Z principal investigator, and my mentor, Zach, and the STC taken by a National Geographic photographer who was taking photos of perseverance from the inside the clean room during the MassCam Z functional test procedure. The top sender picture is of JPL's YouTube live stream of the clean room where you can see me and Zach in STC watching Atlo engineers place a camera calibration target. I took the bottom left picture from the clean room viewing gallery of Atlo engineers positioning camera calibration targets for the full rover camera calibration test procedure. The bottom right shows raw images from the MassCam Z zoom suite taken during the camera cal procedure and the top right image shows me using 3D glasses to look at a 3D image taken by MassCam Z during that procedure. So I hope that gives you an idea of how much thought, preparation, and perseverance goes into each and every one of the hundreds of test procedures used to validate performance. While I will get back to discussing the next phase of Perseverance's mission, launch and cruise soon, I wanted to take this opportunity to share what I think is another really cool test conducted for Perseverance. I mentioned that Perseverance will be landing in Jezero Crater. What's interesting is that Jezero Crater was one of the landing sites under strong consideration for the Curiosity rover. However, Curiosity's landing ellipse, which is essentially a measure of how precise we can make our landing on Mars, was not small enough to guarantee we wouldn't land in a dangerous site at Jezero. Now, however, improvements have been made to decrease the size of Perseverance's landing ellipse to enable it to land at Jezero Crater safely. This slide shows Perseverance's landing ellipse size in comparison to Curiosity's and other previous Mars landers. One of the primary improvements that enabled us to shrink down the landing ellipse is the use of Terrain Relative Navigation, or TRN. TRN allows us to have a closed loop system in which we first take photos of the surface of Mars as we descend in our parachute, then compare these photos to an onboard orbital map, and then divert from our current landing trajectory if necessary. TRN required the addition of a computer and a camera, and, uh, excuse me, it required the addition of a camera and a computer, and the computer is called the vision compute element. And that's all that it really required to be added to the spacecraft, which would be exposed to the surface of Mars after the heat shield is jettisoned and the parachute is deployed, which you'll see in an animation in a few slides. TRN was tested using a flight-like camera and computer system attached to a gimbal on a helicopter over Death Valley. The camera system slewed to simulate the dynamics of the parachute and rapidly took images of the terrain below, just as the cameras would on Perseverance. Here you can see a sequence of the actual images taken from this helicopter te test of the TRN system over Death Valley. The bottom right image is an image of Death Valley taken from a satellite, which serves as a map that is stored on, the, on board the TRN computer. The large image to the left is a magnified view of the blue square at the bottom right, 
and the area outlined in red is the camera's actual field of view. You can see that the boxes within the camera's field of view start at a large size, identifying major land features, and then, and then get progressively smaller as they recognize smaller, more detailed features to pinpoint exactly where the spacecraft is. So I'll play the video now. You'll see the large squares, and then we shift to the smaller squares, identifying smaller, more detailed features. And so this information is used to predict where the spacecraft will land based on its current trajectory and can be used to divert it from a dangerous landing zone if necessary. So you can probably tell that testing is my favorite part of the mission, but let's get back to talking about the main mission timeline. After Perseverance is built and satisfies all of its design requirements through testing, it will launch on an Atlas V rocket from Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida. Its launch, its launch window opens July 22nd, 2020, and Perseverance will then cruise in space to Mars for approximately six months. During this time, Perseverance and its descent stage are packaged up in the cruise stage as shown in the center picture. The next phase is the most intense of Perseverance's life. It is called Entry, Descent, and Landing, or EDL. And there is a whole section of engineers at JPL whose careers are dedicated to sticking landings on other planets in our solar system. Perseverance's landing will be fairly similar to the Curiosity rover's landing, but some important additions have been made, including terrain relative navigation. Here's a video that shows what happens during the EDL phase. So now I'm going to stop sharing and then reshare the uh, YouTube link so you all can hear it. There we are. And I will click play. All right, well, I don't know about you, but I'd say that that was pretty cool myself. I just think it's amazing. <laughs> All right, so. A 
aside from terrain relative navigation, one of the other EDL improvements I am really excited about is the addition of an entire camera and microphone suite to see and hear what EDL is really like. We will get pictures, videos, and audio of multiple angles of the EDL phase. We'll see how our supersonic parachute deploys in the Martian atmosphere, look down at Perseverance as it is lowered from the descent stage using the sky crane mechanism you saw in the video, look up at the descent stage as Perseverance is lowered to the ground, and also look down at the ground as we approach the surface. All of this, plus recording the various sounds we hear during the entire process, will make for an awesome video to share with the public and give valuable insight to scientists and engineers for making future EDL systems better. Once we are on the surface, we can begin our surface operations. During our primary mission, science operations dictate how Perseverance functions. In general, the way Perseverance conducts its science is as follows. To help us navigate to areas on the Martian surface that look interesting to scientists, we do two primary things. First, we look around using MassCAM-Z. Second, we look beneath the surface of Mars for water and ice using RIMFAX by sending radar waves into the ground and measuring their return reflections, similar to how we measure layers of rock and ice in Antarctica here on Earth. Once we identify a location of interest and navigate to it, we conduct precise searches for biosignatures. We can do this from afar using SuperCam, which uses a laser to detect the chemical and mineral makeup of targets as small as a pencil tip from a distance of 20 feet. We can also look for biosignatures up close using Pixel, which uses X-rays to measure concentrations of chemical elements, and Sherlock, which uses a laser to measure organic compounds that are the building blocks of life. If our search for biosignatures looks promising in a certain location based on these measurements, we will use Perseverance's drill to collect a sample and store it in a sample tube for an eventual return to Earth. All the while, we are continuously sensing our surrounding ambient environment using META by measuring things like temperature, humidity, and wind speed. That is the big picture of how Perseverance will function on the surface of Mars and each of the preceding phases that led up to this point. Now that you have an overview of Perseverance, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the extraordinary team behind the rover and my summer working with them. In addition to the technical science and math related challenges present in every space mission, Perseverance's team has team related challenges to solve too. Just the Perseverance science team alone has over 340 members who live in 11 countries working on seven different instruments. Working with team members across the globe introduces cultural barriers in the different ways of life team members lead. We also have intense deadlines to meet since the period during which we can launch spacecraft to Mars only opens for a couple of months every 26 months. As you can imagine, there are also a lot of crazy smart people who work on Mars rovers, and that introduces a slight competitive environment within the team. Finally, coordinating information between thousands of people is essential to avoid team members disagreeing with one another because they heard different things. Solving both the technical and team-related challenges may seem impossible. However, a summer at JPL will convince you otherwise. I worked in Perseverance's payload office, which is a group of around 20 people who work on Perseverance's science instruments. I've included a profile of the payload office to give you a sense of its incredible diversity. Around 50% of the payload team members are women, including the lead payload systems engineer. The payload office has members from Denmark, Brazil, Mexico, France, and all across the United States. There is a wide age range from 23 years old, not including me, to over 60 years old. Members have a variety of educational backgrounds from aerospace to mechanical to electrical to optical engineering. During my time with the payload office, I had the opportunity to be a part of the team. 
but sometimes I would just sit back and observe how they worked with one another to learn how I could become a valuable contributor. I've thought a lot about what makes them function so well, and I settled on something I like to call the three Ps, partnership, perseverance, and passion. Each one of these words means something different, but I found that each one of these words describes a specific quality each and every one of my team members had. I'd like to give you two examples in which I directly experienced these qualities to demonstrate what I mean. Earlier, I spoke about the immense amount of preparation that goes into finally running a test procedure in ATLO. After over a month working on Sherlock's functional test procedure, the team and I were in the system test center on ATLO day. Midway through the test, we discovered that Sherlock's laser, one of the most essential parts of the entire instrument, was not firing. We scrambled to figure out what the issue was until we discovered that one of the over 30 parameters we have to set in Sherlock's laser firing commands was incorrectly set to not allow the laser to fire. It was so simple as a copy and paste mistake in the procedure document. Our team had many options, the easiest of which included blaming one another for such a silly mistake and giving up on this entire section of the test and moving on. However, not a single team member chose to take either of those paths. Instead, they showed tremendous partnership by acknowledging with one another that a bad mistake was made and that they needed each other's help to fix it. They persevered through the setback by immediately flipping through the hundreds of pages of the test procedure to find each laser command that needed to be fixed. And not once did they think about an alternative to getting the job done right in that very moment, despite the odds, because of their passion. Another example of the three Ps that comes to my mind is when we were preparing to deliver all of the supporting hardware for the Sherlock functional test to the big clean room where Perseverance is. Some of the support hardware we needed was an Ophir photodiode shown in the top left, which measures the power output of your laser, and a snout shown in the bottom left picture to hold targets for calibrating our camera. Before any supporting hardware for test procedures is even allowed to be brought into the clean room, you must go through an exhaustive process of physical inspection and technical analysis of each item. Devastating delays to our strict deadlines would occur if any of the flight hardware was damaged by the supporting hardware you bring into the clean room. So multiple reviews are held and a lot of paperwork is required to make sure everything you're bringing into the clean room is safe. I was in charge of this entire daunting process, which involved coordination with planetary protection personnel, contamination control personnel, the ATLO engineers, and my team who put together the test procedure. There were many, many ways for this to go wrong and only one way for it to go right. And the one right way requires a strong team. I was struck by how the people I reached out to whom I had never spoken to before were prepared and happy to help, showing that the partnership between members outside of our direct team was solid, giving a sense that we were all working towards the same common goal. A group of ATLO engineers showed impressive perseverance when I presented them with an incorrect tipping analysis for a tripod by explaining how I should correct my calculations and then checking in with me the following day to see if I needed any additional help. At the end of the certification meeting, after our support hardware got the okay to be brought into the clean room, all of the people I coordinated with came together to celebrate one more important step we had taken to accomplishing our collective goal, our passion, to create something bigger than each of its individual contributors for the benefit of humanity. Aside from experiencing how extraordinary the Perseverance Rovers team is, I also realized that their qualities are not unique. I, an outsider, was able to join the team for a summer and become a valuable contributor to it. I believe anyone is capable of becoming a valuable member of a team and bringing out the three Ps in each of its members. I thought about what I did every day to help me become a valuable member of Perseverance's team 
And I came up with three things that I want to share with you in the hope that they can help you become a valuable member of the teams you are on. The first is to have confidence in your current skill set. When presented with a problem, begin by identifying the relevant skills you currently possess. Typically, every person has the same sort of tool bag with various basic contents, especially if you're a student. Your contents may be basic algebra like addition and multiplication and basic physics like an understanding of forces, energies, and electricity and magnetism. You can differentiate yourself by simply applying your fundamental knowledge to complex problems. Many people miss this opportunity because they are so caught up in getting the final answer that they forget these steps in between. Although the tipping analysis I talked about on the previous slide was wrong, the calculations I did weren't wrong. They were just different than what the Allo engineers wanted. Perhaps their willingness to help me correct my calculations was because I applied what I knew and made an effort to solve the problem. The second is to project a can-do attitude. You will rarely be presented with a problem that does not require you to learn something to successfully complete it. I can't begin to count the number of times I didn't know how to solve a problem the moment it was presented to me last summer. For example, I was asked to contribute to writing the Sherlock functional test procedure and I had no idea about optical path alignment and laser conditioning and power readings, the different laser scan modes and CCD saturation. However, I used the following three-step process to project a can-do attitude. First, acknowledge to yourself and your team members that your tool bag doesn't have all the tools you need to solve the problem, and that's okay. Second, offer possible solutions based on the tools you do have. That shows you're proactive. Third, express confidence that you will acquire the tools you need and find the best possible solution to the problem. Now you're a can-doer. Lastly, and in my opinion, most importantly, get to know your teammates. Hopefully what I've talked about so far convince you that the most important part of any complex space mission or any project in general is the team behind it. Knowing your teammates well will help you to become a more effective team member. Now, I don't necessarily mean you have to be friends with all your team members, but you should make the effort to know them well. When appropriate, ask them how their day is going, ask them what they did over the weekend, and always offer to be of support to them if they ever need it. Doing so recognizes the most fundamental part of the team, that each of its members is a person not just someone you sit across the aisle from every day. For example, I like to write stories and take photographs. So I volunteered to write profile stories for the JPL website about full-time engineers and fellow interns. This way, I got to know people on my team better and even met people outside of my immediate team. JPL is where many people find their calling. Whatever you're interested in, I encourage you to pursue it and find out more about it. Along the way, you'll probably meet like-minded people that you can share your ideas with, which is one of the best experiences you can have. If you're a high school student, college student, or graduate student, NASA has internship opportunities for you. To learn more and keep up with Perseverance, check out the links I have listed here. And last but not least, don't forget to tune in to Perseverance's launch. The launch window opens on Wednesday, July 22nd, 2020, with an estimated landing day on Mars of Thursday, February 18th, 2021. Well, that concludes my presentation. I hope you all enjoyed it, and thank you for taking the time to listen to it tonight. Both Zach and I are happy to take questions now if you have any. So Evan, there are a few people who put some questions up in the chat, and um, I'm gonna just tip my, or turn things over here to folks. Um, Frank, are, if you're still online, you had uh, you had the first question to come up. So I'm gonna give you the floor first if you're there. Yeah, I was just wondering as you were testing uh, your, your, your singular instrument, how do you make sure that 
the program running that instrument is not affecting any other instruments on the rover itself. Um, this is Zach. Or Zach. What, yes, go ahead. <laughs> well, I yeah. was going to say, I mean, my, my understanding is that uh, there really isn't multiple procedures being run at the same time uh, during ATLO. And so the commands you're sending to the rover and well specifically to your instrument are really specific to your instrument they the functionality you're testing is really just exclusive to your instrument so you do have to take precautions to make sure that let's say you're firing a laser you don't want anything to be in the way of the laser beam but um in terms of confusing the rover compute element my understanding is that uh, you don't really run multiple things on the RC at the same time. Zach, is that correct? So we actually we do do a lot of parallelism. There, there are some things that can oh. happen in, happen in parallel. So we we have a couple different ways to deal with this. Um, there are software interlocks to keep us from commanding activities that shouldn't happen at the same time. So for instance, we're not going to send commands to place the robotic arm on a rock and command the drill at the same time as we're going to drive the rover. So there are software interlocks that keep us from sending any arm commands at the same time as we send any mobility commands. Um, so there are other similar restrictions for instruments. So for instance, um, Sherlock has to have certain mechanisms stowed before we do anything that creates by vib causes vibration. So we have software interlocks that keep us from make sure that Sherlock is in that safe state before we actuate the drill or move the robotic arm around. Um, we also do system level testing to verify that we can do different things in parallel. So we do electromagnetic interference and electromagnetic compatibility testing. Um, so we make sure that, for instance, we can take images with mass TMZ during communication passes, or we can take images with certain cameras while the helicopter is flying. The helicopter has a radio that communicates back to the rover to make sure uh, its flight is coordinated appropriately. Um, so we do we do test, we did a ca whole campaign of testing at the system level to make sure that the things we want to be able to do in parallel, we can do in parallel. And as we progressed through the ATLO campaign, we did system tests where we tried to exercise, you know, parallelism um, at a high level. And all of that went very well. So we will be able to take pictures of the helicopter while it's flying and, and take pictures during communication passes. So definitely positive outcome. Great, hey, very interesting. Thank you. You had a Thank second you, David. question, Frank? David Ward. I, my yeah. second question was oh, in the me. landing right. sequence. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, in the landing sequence, what altitudes are these events happening at in the descent profile? Yeah, so I looked up the um, Mars 2020 launch press kit, and I will put a link to this in the chat window if people want to go take a look at this on their own. It's got a bunch of really cool information about Mars 2020. Um, it looks like, so the, the parachute deploys at a range of altitudes anywhere from about 9 to 13 kilometers or uh, 6 to 9 six to eight miles or so depending on atmospheric conditions during landing the the descent stage gets released at about 1.3 miles or 2.1 kilometers above the surface and so there's actually a, a radar terminal descent system radar uh, that will acquire the mars surface and then will release the descent stage and it will begin the sky cream maneuver to lower the rover down to the ground the rover separates from the sky crane at about uh, 20 meters or 60 to 70 feet above the surface. And then it comes down to some fixed distance and then the whole sky crane and rover system lowers down to touch down on Mars. There are cable cutters that release the rover from the sky crane and then the sky crane goes off and crash lands a safe distance away from the rover. Thank you. Yeah. David Worth, if you're still on, you've got the next crack. Hi, I was wondering about the software, and as the rover is being built, each does each um, experimental hardware package have a, a dedicated software development team, or is there a unified group writing software for all of the different experimental packages? Thank you. 
That's that's a great question. I could take a stab at this one as well. So, you know, there's a lot of complexity in this rover. There are a lot of different functions that are happening that have to be coordinated. So that means there's a lot of software to control it all. Uh, we have two computers in the rover, or we call them rover compute elements, RCEs, RCEA and RCEB. Um, and there's a dedicated team that writes all of the rover flight software that runs on those RCEs. A lot of the instruments have their own electronics boxes that then communicate with the RCE, and all of those have their own independent software running on them. And there is generally a separate software team for each instrument. Um, that's also true for a number of other subsystems on the spacecraft. So some of the radios have software within them. And so there's a team that writes software for that. There's a team that writes software for uh, the motor control system that controls all the different motors in the wheels and the uh, remote sensing mast and the arm. Um, so there's you know a lot of software hidden in different places. And usually each subsystem has its own dedicated software team. And then it's you know, the responsibility of system engineers on the project to make sure that all of those different groups are talking to each other and have the right interfaces defined to make sure that you know we can have software systems that communicate appropriately with one another. Thank you. Yeah. So the next question comes from Sarah Austin Willis, uh, uh, who she asked me to go just go ahead and uh -oh. about planetary protection uh, or um, slash what are some of the considerations or guiding principles behind that? So planetary protection is interesting. It's actually one of the few things that we do that is an ob a treaty obligation of the United States. So the Outer Space Treaty that was signed back in the 60s um, requires that spacefaring nations protect other planets from you know contamination that we're that we're sending, uh, so so we are required to make sure that all the spacecraft we send to Mars are pristine and that we're not going to bring you know any Earth bugs with us and, and contaminate Mars. Um, one of you know the, one of the key objectives for Mars 2020 is to begin Mars sample return. So we have this rock coring drill that's going to collect. Uh, several dozen samples to leave behind for a future mission to bring back to Earth. Part of that process is, is also making sure that, you know, anything that we discover in those samples that we bring back to Earth is not something that we inadvertently brought with us. So if we are to discover, you know, biosignatures or organic compounds on life, we want to make sure that's not something that, you know, got on there in the high bay at JPL and then we brought back with us. No, we thought we discovered, you know, life on Mars, but oh, someone just sneezed in the clean room. So the sample caching system has very strict um, requirements on planetary protection and also on contamination control, which are related things. Contamination control is kind of the making sure we don't bring organic compounds of any type. Planetary protection is making sure we don't bring any microbes or, or viable spores. Um, there's also return planetary protection. So we want to protect Earth from any bugs that we might find on Mars. If there is extant life on Mars, uh, we want to make sure we don't end up with, um, you know, bringing something back to, that would harm people. So we um, make sure future parts of Mars sample return will be responsible for making sure that, you know, the samples that we bring back are well encapsulated and cleaned and that nothing from the Mars environment is going to make it back to Earth exposed. So the, the kind of the Earth to Mars planetary protection, protecting Mars from Earth, and then protecting Earth from anything that we might find on Mars for future return sample missions. Great, Zach. Thank you. Um, and Sarah says, thank you so much, Zach. It's fascinating. Uh, OK, Bill Burton. Hi, thank you for presenting. I was wondering if, while it's on the surface, Perseverance will indeed be able to prove the existence of ancient life. Well, is there some scenario that it could it could find some piece of data that will say yes, this is it, or will that final proof really require the return of the samples? That's a great question, and you know that's something that still is. Th there's a lot of debate in the scientific community. Uh, Carl Sagan had a great quote that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And to be able to say, we definitively have found you know, life on Mars 
is a pretty high bar to overcome. Um, if we find a dinosaur bone, you know, maybe or see something running in front of a camera, you know, sure we that find life, but I think the likelihood of that at this point is relatively low. Um, yeah. If we do find evidence of ancient life on Mars, it's probably going to be fossils of microbes that died out three and a half to four billion years ago. Yeah. Um, we know that you know, there's evidence that there was liquid water on the surface of Mars. You see features like Ballas Marineris, you see the Delta and Jezero Crater. Um, you, you see, you know, Gale Crater that had, where Curiosity is right now, we found, you know, rounded river rock type formations, um, things that, you know, that we have no other explanation of how they formed than in a lake with, you know, depositional sediments. Um, if you look at Earth at the same time, you know, three and a half to four billion years ago, we know that we know that Earth and Mars were very similar uh, at that point in, in their past, and we know that life was starting to evolve on Earth back then. Um, some of the oldest fossils that we found on Earth are from Western Australia. There are these very herbally microbial colonies that uh, grow in layers, and make these very striking patterns uh, called stromatolites. So we know that, you know, ancient, at the same time that there, that Mars was this wet environment possibly welcoming to life that there was life evolving on earth so um, that's really the compelling reason to go and you know we're looking for very ancient fossils we're looking for textures and rocks we're looking for any organic compounds that might still be there um, but we i think we really do have to bring the samples back and you know the analogy we always give is that you know the instruments that we're bringing to mars are compromises so Sherlock that Evan talked about a lot um, is a shrunken down version of a lab instrument. There's an analogous lab instrument that takes up, you know, big table in, in somebody's lab at JPL. Um, and to shrink something down to fit in a shoebox, you've got to make compromises with resolution and the amount of power and how large of an area you can scan. Um, and you also have to make compromises about what instruments you get to bring. We got to bring seven instruments from Mars on this mission. Um, there were 50 odd proposals for other instruments in there. You know, a lot of those were great ideas that had merit and would have been valuable investigations that we could do. So when you bring samples back to Earth, you get to interrogate them with a huge number of instruments. And you also get to interrogate them with things that haven't been invented yet. Um, there are still rocks from the moon that were brought back 50 years ago by the Apollo astronauts that people can request and people are coming up with new techniques and new ways to analyze those samples that nobody had dreamed up in 1969 or 1972. So that's the advantage of bringing samples back to Earth. You get to interrogate them with a larger number of tools with better resolution and um, you know maybe we'll be able to use techniques that don't exist right now that we're sending to Mars today. Thank you. Yeah. So Zach and Evan, I've got four more questions that folks have queued up. Do you have a few more minutes? I know we're past nine o'clock. Yeah, I'm good. Sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. So, uh, Robert Converse, you are next in line. I was. <clears throat> can you hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. I was wondering about the uh, the plutonium thermal power system. Is that unique mm -hmm. to this mission? I thought some of the previous missions were solar powered. Yeah, so this is actually a technology that uh, has been around for a long time. The Voyager missions that are on their way out of the solar system right now also use these uh, radioisotope thermoelectric generators. Um, the Curiosity mission that's the last Mars rover also had an RTG. And the way these things work is you have a radioactive source. It generates heat through radioactive decay. And then you have a bunch of thermocouples installed on the outside of the RTG, and those generate electrical power. It's about a you know, 5% efficiency rate, but it lasts for many, many years. Um, the, the Voyager spacecraft, which are over 40 years old now, are still, you know, still have enough electrical power to communicate with Earth, um, even though they're one light, over one light day away. So it's a technology that um, will last for a long time. One of the issues, that the previous Mars missions had that were uh, solar powered, the Mars exploration rovers that launched back in 2003, 2004, um, is that dust accumulates on the solar arrays. And you know, we saw 
cleaning events on the MER rovers. So we would see wind, you know, blow accumulated dust off of the solar panels. But over time, the dust would build up more and more. Um, it's hypothesized that Opportunity that ended its mission last year uh, was a victim of, you know, dust accumulation. There was a, a very severe global dust storm that caused, you know, really thick dust accumulation and, and blocked out a uh, very large percentage of the sun's light on Mars, and it just didn't have enough power to keep its uh, clock going and keep its communication system up and running. And it very likely got too cold and electronics fail below their minimum operating temperatures. Um, so when you have a, an RTG system, you don't have to deal with those issues. It, it really is a more robust system um, from a dust perspective. Great, thank you. And Cal, you're next. Hi, what a great segue, because I was <laughs> going to ask about how a uh, global dust phenomenon that we've seen in the past on Mars would affect uh, the mission, EDL and otherwise. Yeah, so into the first part, uh, for EDL, we actually you know, have to account for that risk um, it turns out that global dust storms usually start at certain times of year. And so we can try and pick EDL to happen um, in a time when it, it's not likely that the uh, global dust storm will happen. It's, that's kind of tied to the launch opportunity. 2020 is a launch opportunity where we're not likely to hit that global dust storm window. I think I have to go back and look at all the um, trajectory models, but I think 2022, which is the next launch opportunity 26 months from now, um, we would be getting to Mars at a time where we would be likely to be there at the middle of global dust season. Um, for EDL, that changes the density of the atmosphere a little bit and may change the wind profiles. I think you could probably still land, but it would be certainly more challenging. Um, but other impacts to the mission, you know, it affects the ability of the cameras to take high quality images. So it means that you probably can't drive as far. Uh, if, Visibility is limited. If you think about driving in fog or a blizzard, and you know that's really not an ideal time to be on the road. And it's the same thing if you know you can only see ten meters away. Uh, you're not going to try and drive thirty meters at a time necessarily. Um, there are some thermal impacts. It, it um, changes temperatures a little bit, but we should be able to plow through. Unlike uh, if we had solar panels, so. The, the Curiosity rover was able to keep going through the last global dust storm that took opportunity or took uh, opportunity offline. Great. Uh, next one comes from Michael O'Rourke. He also uh, is having his some mic trouble tonight, so I'm just going to read his question. Very simply, what's the estimated duration of the mission? Yeah, so the I think the requirement that we have is a one and a half Mars year mission duration, which works out to um, about a thousand sols. A sol is what we call a day on Mars. Um, it's a few minutes longer than an Earth day, and we plan on a sol by sol basis. So, yeah, it'll be about um, that works out to something around two Earth years. But we hope that. Um, the spacecraft will keep going beyond that. You know, Opportunity, I think, lasted a little over 15 years. Curiosity has been going since uh, 2012. So we're hopeful that this will be a, a long lasting mission as well. <laughs> you got a pretty good track record of getting <laughs> things. Right, right. So I'm going to take, uh, you know, Chairman's, uh, uh, my, my, my own privilege here for and ask the last question, um, or what I think may be the last question. Um, so I noticed, Evan, on your on one of your early slides um, about the Watson um, uh, instrument that the sequence you showed had um, had the camera taking light frames and dark frames, just like we do when we're doing our astrophotography. So that makes me wonder how uh, how long are your exposures? Uh, you know, and I'm going to say, you know, when you're taking a terrestrial, and I know it's not terrestrial because it's on Mars, but I don't know the right word. Uh, how long are your exposures that you need to take dark frames 
to stack with your and 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 get you know get rid of sensor noise and bias from your images. Uh, this is really digging back deep. I, <laughs> I remember, you know, I did write some of these commands, but uh, Zach, am I right in thinking that the exposure times were about a second, maybe a little under a second, depending on the lighting levels? Yeah, usually a few hundred milliseconds. So we take the dark frames um, to characterize dark current. It's also good just to understand the flux of uh, cosmic rays. Mars doesn't have a magnetosphere, and so we see more cosmic rays than we do on Earth. Um, but re you know, really, the key purpose of those is to characterize the the dark current. Um, we don't necessarily downlink those all the time. All the time, um, for testing purposes, those have been useful to understand any kind of signal noise mm -hmm. or compatibility, you know, electromagnetic interference, things like that. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And actually, there was one one question just came in, uh, uh, Evan, and Bob was at one asking <laughs> if you borrowed your three D glasses from a movie theater. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, well, actually, Zach came in in the morning and was just like, you know, I walked into this cube and he was like, here, put these on. And then <laughs> I, I did. And then he said, look at that. And then I looked at the screen. I was like, whoa, it's 3D. Whoa. So, Zach, where, where did you get the glasses from? <laughs> <laughs> they just apparated JPL. We, <laughs> we have a supply. <laughs> Very cool. Each test procedure. Okay. Gentlemen, yeah. thank you very much. There's been a lot of other comments scrolling up on the screen with thanks from all the folks. We really do appreciate you taking time for this. And Evan, if I can, for the moment, I'm going to take over the share for just a second sure. because I want people to know that. Our next meeting is uh, going to be talking to us about remote sensing and spaceborne planetary observations. Dennis is, uh, he's, he's got a lot of credits to his name. So um, this ought to be pretty interesting. He's worked on things, uh, including the land, the, the, the Landsat uh, series of satellites. So he's going to have a lot to say about, about what we're able to do with, with spaceborne planetary observations and remote sensing. Uh, with that, one more time, gentlemen, thank you very much. Everybody else, thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, yeah, the, the uh, compliments keep scrolling up, gentlemen. I think y'all were a hit. Uh, Evan, we topped off at 84 people at one point here. So wow, a great audience tonight. Excellent. Well, again, thank you so much for uh, ha having me and Zach. And uh, thank you to everyone for attending. I I'm glad everyone seems to have enjoyed it. Yes, indeed. All right. Have a good evening, everyone. Have a good week. And I'll see many of you uh, in the middle part of July. Thank you very much.